Hey guys, how's it going? It's Al. Welcome back to another week seven on DraftKings. We're going to talk about the lineup builder show. We're going to go over everything that there is to talk about everything that my Twitch chat can come up with. We're going to discuss whether it's lineup strategy for cash games, whether it's lineup strategy for tournaments, uh, game theory. There's a couple of new injuries on the slate. One of our cover boys from the top stacks video, Antonio Brown is out. And as instructed in that video, if Antonio Brown was out, uh, I don't want you to play him this weekend. So good job. Do not play Antonio Brown this weekend, guys. Well done. Love that you got that message. We are going to hit this video hard like we do every single week. 45 to 60 minutes taking questions from the chat. Hopefully this will help you kind of organize your mind, to get you ready for the NFL DFS Week 7 slate on DraftKings. Thank you for being here. Drop a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel. Ring the notifications bell. And leave me a comment down below. Links to everything are right there in the description. Just click show more. There will also be stuff uh, for you to click on in the pin comment. Drop a like on that pin comment down below. Just let me know that you see it. And let's hit the video. He's a legend. Basketball season is obviously here. It just started this week. And if you are playing NBA for the first time in Daily Fantasy, I would highly suggest you taking a look at one of our partners here on the stream, EstablishTheRun.com. There is a link down below in the pinned comment. It is also in the description, smizzle.tv slash ETR, or you can just use the promo code that's right up there in the corner, smizzlife at checkout. And if you're a new customer, you will get 10% off of a new subscription. If you are a props player, they have a great props program. It's $199 for the whole season. It includes all the way through the NBA Finals. So 26-week regular season, two-and-a-half-month playoff. Uh, if you're just a DFS player, it's right here. The combo package gets you $50 off of that. And if you apply the coupon, that takes it down to $400. Uh, really great deal here if you're playing Daily Fantasy. It's less than $10 a week from now until the end of the Finals. So go check out EstablishTheRun.com. Use that promo code SMIZLIFE at checkout, and let's bring in the chat. So we are going to poll. First thing we're going to do, we're going to go through and we're going to poll the, let's say, the five most popular plays at every position. My mods are going to run those polls. We'll let you know the answers uh, that the chat comes up with to try and come up with where your cash game should start at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end. Uh, if one of the mods wants to throw up a poll for the quarterbacks, that would be great. Uh, OJ Howard, oh, let's talk about the first thing, right? So like the, the elephant in the room is, is obviously the Buccaneers, right? So we have that. Antonio Brown was ruled out. Rob Gronkowski was ruled out. So what does this do to the Buccaneers offense? First of all, Tom Brady's good and he's just going to beat Tom Brady. So 42, 41, this is attempts, 43 attempts, 55 attempts, 36 against Atlanta, but was extremely efficient in that game. Remember, efficiency, not volume, is what leads to quarterback scoring. But if you have volume plus efficiency, it leads to like massive ceiling games, like here against Miami, where he threw the ball over 40 times and threw for five touchdowns and 411 yards. If he just has this day where like he throws it 30 times and is ridiculously efficient, has like four touchdowns, uh, and possibly five, he'll be viable for tournaments and he'll be able to support two pass catchers. If he has one of these games, and again, the narrative is, well, they're going to get so far ahead that they're not going to have to throw the ball. They were way ahead against Philly. This 28 to 22 game was nowhere near as close uh, as that final score. He threw for 297 and threw it 42 times. Against Miami, they won 45 to 17, threw it 41 times for 411 and five touchdowns. So like, this narrative that people want to build in, that he's not going to be able to sustain multiple wide receivers, uh, is kind of off, right? It's just not real. Taking a look at who his targets have been this year, Mike Evans getting 20% of the targets, 20.18% of the targets. Chris Godwin at 19.3. Antonio Brown will vacate 13.6% of the targets. Rob Gronkowski is going to vacate 9.2% of the targets. And going back over here, to DraftKings to kind of take a look at this. Pull up Tampa Bay. They're in the afternoon. So we pull up their team. We look at their flex plays. First two players is going to affect, obviously, Mike Evans. Was previously projected to be a low percentage player this week. Not a lot of people are going to be on him because there's a lot of plays at wide receiver. I think that that percentage is going to massively spike right now. 
uh, not to like 30%, but probably closer to like, I don't know, eight to 15, somewhere in that range. Uh, with Brown out, you also have Godwin, who's going to do the same thing. Should have a, a much higher floor of targets and more access to a ceiling with less people to compete against. The winner on the outside is going to be Tyler Johnson, in my opinion. If you think it's going to be Scotty Miller, go ahead, play Scotty Miller. I personally think that the winner on the outside, when they go to three wide, is going to be Tyler Johnson. Uh, so that's going to be who it is. UNC says he can't start a poll. I'll start the poll uh, whenever I get a chance. At tight end, the last two games without Rob Gronkowski, Cam Brait was who we originally thought was going to be uh, running the primary spot, but he's not running a lot of routes and he's not getting targeted on the routes that he runs. He's also playing less snaps than OJ Howard. So on the surface, and it says Howard was limited at Thursday's practice, but after Friday's practice, they said he's in. We'll see how it goes. Uh, if both are active, OJ Howard is my preferred tight end on the Buccaneers if you wanted to play him. Had a really great game against Philadelphia. Six catches on seven targets, including a touchdown. Got an end zone target in that one that resulted in the touchdown. Ran, played more snaps than Brait. Ran routes on more dropbacks than Brait. And was targeted on like 38, 39% of the routes that he ran by Tom Brady. Tom Brady targets worth more than your average quarterback, replaceable level quarterback target. So OJ Howard, if I was to, to try and look for a cheap option at tight end on the Buccaneers, it would be OJ Howard. So there's the full tight end breakdown. Hopefully that helps. Ace Viper says, I'm going to overplay Ty Johnson. Multiple choice in chat. I got I to gotta come up with it unless polls have been disabled. Great. It looks like polls have been disabled. Awesome. Great. Do I think it's necessary to have some late game equity so you can take advantage of swaps? I always think that it is uh, positive to have equity in the late games, have some players available in the late games, but I don't think that it's totally necessary. I don't think it's a thing that you have to do, right? Um, it doesn't matter when a player plays. You just have to have the most points. However, if there are going to be popular plays in the afternoon, and I do think that there will be popular plays in the afternoon from the Tampa Bay side. I think that uh, a couple of players on Philly and Las Vegas are going to be a little popular. Obviously, the Rams game is going to have a heavy percentage of players in it from Cooper Cup to Daryl Henderson. Uh, even DeAndre Swift is going to catch a double digit number in percentage in the Millionaire Maker. Then you have some players on Arizona and Brandon Cooks on the other side, all of whom are going to be somewhat popular. So fading those players and locking yourself out from some of that late swap equity is probably a mistake. Uh, if you're playing cash games... It's very important that like, obviously I can't do the, the thing now, right? With the polls, like we could talk about them, but like I can't really do the thing with the polls now, but like, let's just say that he's the right cash game player running back. <laughs> he was going to win the poll anyway. Like, I don't, you know, whatever, like Henderson Jr. was going to win the poll. He was going to be the, you have to play him at cash games once again, playing against the Lions uh, and he's also going to be like 25% in, in the Millionaire Maker. But he plays in the afternoon. So let's say you're playing a head-to-head -head game, and you lock in Daryl Henderson Jr., and you have one player left to go in your lineup, and your opponent in your head-to-head -head has one player left to go in his lineup, and he's beating you. You're behind. You have to swap out Daryl Henderson Jr., because you go from having a zero chance to win in that situation to having some chance to win in that situation. Uh, so yeah, I believe leaving yourself out is a key for me pretty much at all times. Specific question, Miles Sanders. His volume numbers seem great. He's been massively underperforming so far this year. Uh, do we think he should be in play at, he's 5,100, right? You said 52, it's still that range. Yeah, he's 5,100. So here's the thing with Miles Sanders. Philly can't run the ball outside of Jalen Hurts running the ball. Philly cannot run the football like not even a little bit, okay? Um, but Miles Sanders has been on the field an awful lot, 75 to 85% of the time getting all of the snaps at running back 
for this team. Kenny Gainwell had a lot of the bigger splash plays early in the season. He really stood out, uh, scored a few touchdowns, had some big gains, did very well. So Miles Sanders is not going to be a player who's going to get you 20 touches. However, if he's utilized correctly, and that's really the, the question, are they going to utilize him correctly, and throw him the ball actually past the line of scrimmage. A couple of weeks ago, he had like negative 34 air yards. That's not great. Like you could throw him five passes. How do you get six? You know, how do you get six receiving yards on five targets on when you catch all of them? It's because they're throwing him the ball five and six yards behind the line of scrimmage. So if you're doing that, it's not going to be great. If they throw him the ball on little square ends, on little circle routes, on screen passes with blockers in front of him, it's going to lead to more gains. Right now, he's just getting kind of check downs and not doing anything great. So the amount of time that he's playing, he is the primary running back. If they score a rushing touchdown, it probably should be Miles Sanders rushing touchdown. They do get some of their offensive line back this week, so that might help uh, on top of you know, uh, in, in terms of his rushing efficiency, he definitely has big splash ability. 5,100 is very cheap, but like there's so many plays at running back, including ones in that range. Can you say that Miles Sanders is definitively better than Mike Davis at that price point? Can you say that Miles Sanders is definitively better than JD McKissick at that same price point? I don't think you can. And it, it's not like they're the only plays. You know, like, is he definitively better than Michael Carter? So you're putting yourself in like a really dangerous spot here with much better plays that are slightly more expensive. Damian Harris at 5,700 at home, should get 20 touches against a defense that has not done well against the run. They're favored in this spot. Does get the inside the five work. Uh, it, it, Edmonds, assuming he plays, right? Can you tell me that, that Miles Sanders is better than Chase Edmonds? Based on current volume, they're essentially the same. Yeah? Williams, we have to wait until tomorrow. Unvaccinated. Uh, so he needs to clear all the protocols and he can't do that until Saturday afternoon. So we won't know at any point in time by the end of this video that he's active and available. And even if he is active and available, it's not as though they didn't have a really solid outcome from Khalil Herbert uh, seeing 37 carries the last two weeks showed a little bit of proficiency in the passing game and like they're going to be playing from behind by a lot and on the road touches might not be exactly what we want for Damian Williams even if he does clear all the protocols I think that there's a lot of plays at running back and I don't think that based on their pricing you have to get all too cute on DraftKings or FanDuel this week Congrats, Bears running backs. You've done all right. Here's Tampa. Good luck. Yeah, it's a, that's my point. It's a split at best if you're considering playing Williams. Do I think Alex Collins will play? They're on, they're on Monday. Is Gaskin a cheap player or is his usage weird? It's very weird extremely weird do we talk about other 6k running backs like chuba uh th that's where all of them are it's like all the running backs are mostly in that range initiated thank you very much for the 28 months like the, the guys that exist between 6 and 7k i think is where most of the plays are going to be made this week i think that's where most of the percentage in tournaments is going to be obviously He's good. He projects at 9% in tournaments. I think he's going to be closer to, to 14 or 15%. Whatever. He's good. Aaron Jones, also good. 
he he doesn't fit into the meta this week because like guys that are cheaper than him uh project for a little bit more volume guys that are cheaper than him have a higher points per dollar which makes aaron jones to me a very fantastic tournament play this week five box running back 7500 we know that he is like one of the most likely running backs over the past two seasons in this offense to have multiple touchdown games not going to play 80 percent of the snaps probably going to play 60 to 65 and get the lion's share of the work um so aaron jones fine but this is where the bulk of the people are going to be Daryl Henderson, I, I believe that he will be the highest played running back this week. Leonard Fournette, going to catch a major percentage based on his usage and price. Uh, Cordell Patterson, people are going to play him. He's 6,300 against Miami because he's been uh, he's done really, really well this season on very few snaps. Josh Jacobs, another five box running back. I think he's going to catch maybe the lowest percentage in this group, which makes him probably one of the better tournament plays in this group. Again, five box running back. DeAndre Swift getting essentially Alvin Kamara type usage from previous seasons. Like when they used to like throw the ball to Alvin Kamara. Remember that? That was fun. It was really fun when they used to throw Alvin Kamara the ball. That was great. I liked that. That was that was a much better allocation uh, of Alvin Kamara, at least a uh, deployment of Alvin Kamara for fantasy was when they would run him 12 to 15 times and throw it to him six to 10 times a game. I liked that version of Alvin Kamara. Can we have that version of Alvin Kamara back? That would be great. Cause right now we have Deandre Swift in that version. Uh, and he's doing really well, averaging 18 fantasy points per game, which is greater than three times his salary this week on DraftKings. He will also carry a percentage, not just on his own merit as a standalone, but anybody who's playing Rams secondary stacks or Rams primary stacks, DeAndre Swift probably going to be the most popular bring back in either of those. So that is where I believe most of the people are going to go with their running back allocation is kind of in that range. And then obviously Williams as well. Can I go over how I start building my lineups? I click players. I pick my favorite games in wide receivers and go from the, so like I keeping it as simple as possible and answer for that, identify who the value plays are that you really want to have as the core uh, of your play, then identify the quarterbacks that you want to stack or double stack. I prefer to double stack. Uh, identify the games that you want to utilize as secondary stack players. And then I make lineups. That's it. There's no like, it's not all that difficult in terms of like how you go, how to go about building lineups. Identify your top plays at every price point. Good values and good values doesn't just mean sub 4K. Good values means I think these players are good plays this week and should pro uh, could produce over what their salary entails, right? Not just on a point per dollar output, but like players that are priced at this typically uh, produce this many points and this guy is projected to produce more than that. So therefore points over projected salary. Um, Tyler Johnson and cash too cute? Probably. I think Tyler Johnson's fine in a GPP. I don't think that he's necessary in cash, but like, uh, feel free to change my mind. That's fine. I'm always, I'm always open on new information, but like, assuming Sammy Watkins is out, that's a much better cash game play at 3,400. He's got like, you know, 25% of the targets. He's 3,400. Uh, what is their team total right now? So like here, let's sort by the highest implied live team totals. These are the lowest. Uh, so you don't want players, a lot of them from those teams, unless they're going to get there on volume because you're probably not getting touchdowns from them because there's less touchdowns to go around. The Rams have a total of 33. That's a lot of freaking points. The Cardinals have a total of 32 and a quarter. That's a lot of freaking projected points for them. The Chiefs, 31. The Bucks, 30. Play players from these teams <laughs> if you can find them for... A cheap price. Green Bay, 27. That's four touchdowns. A lot of points. Tennessee, 26. Great shootout opportunity in a game with a total of 57 and a half and has climbed a point since opening. Baltimore, 26 and a half. Bateman can get there on volume alone. If he sneaks into the end zone, it's, it's ridiculous. Why is the Cardinals defense only 3,100? I don't know. I don't. Why have the Packers come down too? I don't know. Got bet down too. 
They opened as 10 point favorites. They're now seven and a half point favorites. And it looks like they got bet down while getting more of the bets, right? So reverse line movement here. 59% of the bets have been on Green Bay. 41% of the bets and it's moved in their favor. So I guess a very massive, large money bet being placed on this side of it, right? On, on the WFT side that they're going to cover probably was eight or eight and a half at that point. If it goes below seven, if it crosses that important seven point line, then it's like really a thing for them to cross that threshold would certainly be a thing. Has there been any others that have moved or moved on line movement? Not really, right? Like 80% of the bets in the Patriots. Patriots always get more money on them. Uh, and it's only moved 0.5. Because again, going across that seven point threshold takes a lot. Lamar Andrews stack going to go crazy this week. I believe that there are three players that you can stack with Lamar this week. Uh, if you're stacking him, Andrews, I think Marquise Brown is solid. And especially for, I mean, for tournaments specifically, I think Bateman is solid for tournaments or, or cash games. Would I play Henry and D Williams in the same lineup this week for a KC double stack? Probably not. Marquise drops touchdowns Brown. Yeah, but imagine when he doesn't, it's going to be glorious. Giants wide receivers are a tire fire. I agree. Um, let's take a look. Oh, yeah. By the way, the Smiz Gang Listener League. Let's see how many people are in it right now. 1,500. So we just crossed the halfway mark. 3,000 entrants. $10 to enter. Three max. Absolutely no rake. All the money that gets put in in entry fees gets paid back out to you guys. No service fee. That's what rake means. No service fee from DraftKings to run this tournament. Uh, it's a promotional league just for our community. So get in there, get your lineups in, try and win some money. We'll go over all the winners on the second channel, Al Smizzle Games, on Monday on the recap video. Also, I'm live six days a week on Twitch during football season. So come by the stream, hang out. I'm live six days a week. Uh, looking at the Giants. <sighs> Look at all the letters. This is like an episode of Sesame Street. This is ridiculous. Today, the Giants wide receiver core is brought to you by the letters Q, D, I, and R. So Kenny Galladay did not practice Thursday. My buddy Jordan reported. You got to wait for the Friday practice report. Now, Sterling Shepard's got a hammy, but is participating in Friday's practice. Hopefully, he's still around. Tony, probably not going to play, is not practicing Friday. Uh, Darius Slayton is participating Friday. Game time decision on Sunday. John Ross. Guess what, guys? John Ross is injured. Is Dante Pettis going to be a thing? Again? I mean, if literally everybody's injured, then yeah, he's going to be a thing. So Dante Pettis got all the targets that were going to go to Kadarius Tony last week. He stepped in, in that next man up role for the giants in place of Kadarius Tony, who left the week six game against the Rams with his ankle. Sterling Shepard got 14 targets in that game, caught 10 of them. And Dante Pettis in that, Kadarius Tony roll got 11 targets, caught five of them. He's flipping 3K. If Galladay's out, Shepard's out. This is not for sure. But let's just say Galladay out, Shepard in, Tony out, Slayton out, Ross out. He's a legend. Then Pay then Dante Pettis is gonna be a freaking thing at 3K. Just saying. He's gonna get eight to twelve targets at 3K, and that's impossible to pass up. Okay, Nick, thank you very much for the 14 months. Like you may not like it, but learn to love it because at 3K, it's the best thing going. Woo.
Imagine if the Giants could even utilize Evan Ingram. That would be cool. I mean, the Clapper is calling the plays, so. And by the way, Evan Ingram now, Evan Ingram now has a calf injury. He did practice on Friday. But he didn't practice Thursday because he injured his calf at practice. So just another pass catcher who's got problems. Thoughts on a two-a double stack with Waddle and Gesicki for tournaments with Ridley as a bring back. I like it. Talked about it on the Top Stacks video. You're basically going over the Top Stacks video. That's what we did. I like that stack. And I think that people are probably going to vomit on themselves a little bit and not want to play two of double stacks. Got to be hurt to Lamar and Cash this week? Uh, could be. Depends on the rest of your build. Quarterback doesn't matter as much to me in Cash. You, just, you want to not brick the quarterback. Quarterback doesn't have to, like, smash for you to do fine in cash. Right? Quarterback doesn't have to smash for you to do well in your head-to-head -head games, right? So typically, we're paying probably around this range down to, like, this range, right? Definite floor-ceiling issue here. Like, Tua doesn't have, like, the highest floor. He just doesn't because he's not very efficient. Matt Ryan, way more efficient. I'd prefer Matt Ryan to Tua if you're paying way down in cash. Derek Carr, I don't love it, but I get it. Like, if you want to come down to 6K, I'm fine with that. Tannehill, I would be more interested in for cash than usual. As much as they're throwing the ball and as much as they're throwing the ball into the end zone and he does provide a rushing floor and it is an up pace game in the highest team total of the, uh, the highest total overall on the week, an argument can be made for Ryan Tannehill regression positively to the mean uh, as the season wears on. He should have way more touchdowns than six right now. Uh, he's trailing in terms of expected touchdowns versus actual touchdowns but it's going to depend on his receiving core like julio jones may play may not play aj brown i believe aj brown is just pooping clear at this point he's he ate some bad chipotle a week ago and he's still in a bad way about it uh so it depends mostly on that I think that Jalen Hurts is totally fine for cash based on the rushing yard floor that he brings. Do not expect two rushing touchdowns from every week to bail you out. But also, I expect more than one touchdown every other week uh, from him in the passing game. I really feel like it's kind of a pay-up week for quarterback. Whether that quarterback, uh, in cash specifically, whether that quarterback is Stafford, whether that quarterback is Lamar, uh or whether you want to pay all the way up for Aaron Rodgers, I'm fine with any one of them. Uh, it just depends on what the rest of your build looks like. And I think that there's more than enough value to make it a reality. Galladay is officially out now? Good. That just came out. So we've... <laughs> God, that's so ugly. So looking back... Galladay out. Shepard probably... Tony, out. Slayton, game time. It's very possible that Pettis could be a thing. I'm not saying he's a thing yet. I still prefer Bateman. But, like, if one more of these guys are out, then Pettis is the one playing a lot. I actually like this slate a lot. I really do like this slate. Is Booker in play? He can. I'm not thrilled about it. He'll get volume for sure. He'll get volume for sure. So you have that. Favorite sub 6K running back? Uh, Williams on Kansas City. It's 5,800. Getting 85% of the snaps on the Chiefs offense. Problem with Tannehill and Henry in the same lineup as a surrogate for Mahomes to stack this game. Uh, tough for both of them to get there. Even with, so like, <laughs> Derrick Henry could set an all-time high for himself 
in terms of catches in a season this week. <laughs> That's how dumb his usage has been in the in the passing game in previous years. That he could break his career record for catches in a season in week seven. But he still doesn't correlate very well with Tannehill. But it is possible that both can go off. Uh, but you're talking about a Tannehill, Henry, and a single pass catcher stack. Like, here's the guy that I was... Right? Like, Daryl Williams, super good. In terms of volume, super good. Uh, the rest of the guys in this range, we talked about already. Harris, Edmonds. Connor's going to be an interesting one. Connor is the when you win, what do you win argument. And I kind of feel like when you win, you don't win much. If James Connor gets the ball 15 times and scores two touchdowns, what do we win? For you to win with this, all the other players in this range have to fail. Everyone else. Which could certainly happen. But he's well behind Daryl Williams for me in this price range. And he's well behind Damian Harris for me in this price range. So for him, for you to win, he has to have two touchdowns. And in the two games where he has already scored two touchdowns this season, he scored 18 fantasy points, 20 fantasy points. That's not a win. You're not winning a tournament with that. Like, even when you get the desired outcome, even when you get the ceiling game from James Conner, you're still not getting there. Now, of course, that means that James Conner is going to run for 130 yards and three touchdowns this week, and he's certainly going to get there, and I'm going to look like an idiot, but like... The problem is the way that he's being deployed and added to his current skill set, right? As not a big splash runner. He's not going to give you that Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry, uh, Jonathan Taylor big play. That's not something like it could happen. But like a lot, the stars would have to, every planet would have to be in perfect alignment for that thing to happen. It's not something that exists in his game currently. So like, if James Conner is the reason why I don't win tournaments this week, like I'm probably going to X out James Conner. I probably will have 0% James Conner. Because when you win, what do you win? And I don't think you win very much when you win with James Conner. If he has 22 fantasy points, that's not going to be the thing that carries you. You know, to the top of the tournament field. It's just not. Is it too early to play Ertz this week in a new system? No. We went over this. I believe that uh, on another video or just on stream, I don't remember which one it is. I believe that Ertz is simply going to step into the role that Max Williams had. Which is a very fantasy-friendly role on an offense that has a projected implied team total of 30 points or more. What do I consider slate-breaking? 5x value or more than 25? I mean... If a player has like 40 plus points... If a player's 25% played and has 40 points, you have to you probably have to have that guy to win. You don't always have to have that guy to win. We've seen that happen where Tyreek Hill had a massive game earlier this season uh, and was 15 or 20% and he was not on the winning millionaire maker lineup because other guys also had massive days that it was like week 2. 
Favorite 5K wide receiver, Shepard. Can't wait for the Henry Bateman Pettis lineups to win the Millionaire Major. If Pettis catches eight balls, right? I'm just, I'm spitballing here. But like if Pettis catches eight balls and Bateman catches six, 14 catches for 6,400 is a lot. Wasn't that the CPAT week? Yeah. I believe it was. Does Herbert have a chance against the Tampa Bay line? Nobody does. I, I never do that. Pettis for what team? The Giants. With everybody out, UNC. Like if Slayton is ruled out on Sunday, right now, again, we're uh, this is this is way too much New York Giant pass game talk. It's like the third time I've gone back to this. Galladay out, Tony out. Shepard going to get his 10 targets because he always does. And 1.65 uh, expected points per target for him at his current deployment means 16 fantasy points as a median. Uh, Slayton is a game time decision. If he's out, Pettis last game when Tony went out, got 11 targets. Wasn't even supposed to play. It was like he just walked through the parking lot and got 37 targets. It was ridiculous. Dimes might have to do some rushing this week. They have to run him every week. So like the slate is alive and it's going to go back and forth. But like two players that I thought were going to be extremely popular because they're going to be cash game plays was this at wide receiver. Shepard at 56 and Cooks at six. But now we have an awful lot of value. Some of it cash game value, like Bateman. Some of it tournament value. Like Tyler Johnson. Tyler Johnson could have two points, guys. Or he could have 20. You know, only a tournament play for me at this point. And then the possibility of Pettis. Assuming uh, injury. If Slayton cannot go this weekend, Pettis steps into an even larger role. So now we have three potential value plays, all of whom have good bringback plays attached to them. Can you think of a, a player to, that, to play on Cincinnati? Anybody on Cincinnati you might want to play? Can you think of any players uh, that you want to tie to Tom Brady? Maybe catch some value here. We also just had more tight end value open up as we spoke about at the top with OJ Howard. We have another value tight end. So like your paths to getting specific things that you might want to pay for are now available where they weren't as clearly available before. You can, you can pay for the things. You know, 19,000 left for three spots. 6,300 average. So like you can, you can do whatever you want this week. You can go balance or you can go stars and scrubs. It's completely up to you. And scroll to the lineup on YouTube. Yeah, that's where I'm going to drop an ad. An ad just hit YouTube. Like when that was up on the screen, I was, I had like five names on the screen. Ad. They can think I'm building a lineup all they want. I have a lot of very good viewers on YouTube that watch the whole videos that like will reply with like a random joke that I made. Like they watch and listen. It's great. I love my viewers. And then there's the, there's the scrollers that'll just scroll through. Oh, there he's got like six players. Let me, let me click right there. That's where I drop the ads. How do I feel about two pass catchers and a bring back as a secondary stack? Uh, I think it's fine if used sparingly. But as I said, 
usually it's there's like one game that's above 30 we have four four teams not game we have four teams with a total above 30 so like typically it's like well i want to play hill and i want to play kelsey but i can't afford hill kelsey and mahomes so i'll play hill kelsey and then one player from tennessee that's kind of in that mid-range value and then go with a different quarterback stack right but like you could do that with like I don't know. I'm on St. Ra and Henderson and Cup. Now, look, I think Henderson and Cup are going to carry a really high percentage. So if you're going to play both of them in the same lineup, you really have to differentiate with your primary quarterback stack or whatever. If you're using them as a double bring back, as a double secondary. Uh, same thing with Arizona. A lot of points. We don't know where they're going. Right, there's a lot of players on that Arizona offense. So like we don't really know where all of those points are going and it's very tough to nail it. Right? So like Hopkins has gotten six touchdowns this season. That's a lot of touchdowns considering his usage. There's no way he should have scored six touchdowns on 38 targets. He shouldn't. That should not be a thing. But it is and he's 7700 because of his name and the touchdowns but like he's not getting utilized the same way that he was in years past christian kirk we've seen him do well this year on way more targets and has big splash ability as he's being targeted downfield aj green three touchdowns consistently getting targeted six times except for the one game against san francisco where they targeted him twice the tight end spot that we were talking about before. Max Williams was getting really heavily used in this three-week span from two to four. He got injured in week five, uh, DNP week six. 15 targets is, is a solid amount for a, for a cheapish tight end. And now you have Ertz stepping into that role. You know, the previously thought of as dust, Zach Ertz just like the previously thought of as dust, AJ Green, who is clearly not dust. And then they still have Rondale Moore, who's as boomer bust as they come and now back down to like 4,400. He's at that range where you can take shots on him in tournaments because of how bouncy he is and how involved he is in the offense. They know they have to get him the ball. They just have a lot of players out there in the field. So the problem with Arizona is as talented as this team is, and then you work in James Conner getting all the inside the five carries, Chase Edmonds getting the ball really a lot, getting like the James White treatment for New England just in a much more high-powered offense than New England is currently or previously last year. There's a lot of players that are trying to split four touchdowns every week. When you got six guys fighting for four touchdowns, it's much more difficult than three guys fighting for four or five touchdowns. Cup and Henry are doable. Yeah, it's definitely doable. Naked Kyler, okay. Not in tournaments. Naked quarterback in tournaments is... it. Well, look, things can work. The way that I explained it on the Fantasy Focus podcast yesterday. You have nine spots to fill. And with sports betting becoming as big a thing as it is in this country now, at least now that it's in the light, right? Sports betting was always a big thing in this country, but now it's a big thing in front of the curtain instead of behind the curtain. Hitting a nine-team parlay is extremely difficult. You want to take defense out of that? Well, it's not nine because defense is uh, whatever. So it's an eight-team parlay. Hitting an eight-team parlay is really, really hard. You know what's less difficult? It's, it's easier to be right about one thing than it's to be right about four things. So if I'm going to play a quarterback stack with a bring back, this is why we double stack and bring back. If I go like this, like this, and like this, let's say, let's, let's leave a wide receiver spot. Let's do this. Um, and then let's do this. Let's assume Mooney's in, right? I only got to be right about one thing that this game's going to score a lot of touchdowns. 
I got right about one thing. Tom Brady's going to throw touchdowns. Here's the limited amount of people. There's really three people that most of those touchdowns are going to go to, or at least on a high percentage. Uh, and then you do that. Where if you're picking four different guys, if you're saying, okay, I think that Kyler is going to be a really high scoring quarterback. I think that Mike Evans uh, is a and just isolate them. Mike Evans might be a really good play this week because Gronk is out, so therefore he should get more end zone targets. Um, I think that uh, in the 4,000 range, let me pick somebody in there, right? Like, let's say, well, you know, I also really like, um, I, I'm just randomly picking a player. I, I think T. Higgins is a good player, and I also randomly think that Miles Sanders is going to do well. Here's four completely unattached players. Fine, you wanted it to be a tight end because the other one was a tight end? Here's four completely not attached players that are not correlated with one another at all. I got to be right about four separate things for this lineup to win. I really only got to be right about one thing in the other in the first iteration is that Tampa Bay and Tom Brady are going to throw for a lot of touchdowns and a lot of yards and that Chicago is going to have to chase and therefore, the other guy's going to see a lot of targets too. So I really only have to be right about one thing. Yes, I'm talking about the four spots I had filled up. I need one thing to happen, really, to make that happen. That's why you see the top 100 in tournaments littered with double stack bringbacks. Is OJ Howard a free square? No. Free square, no. He's fine but I would not go so far as to saying he's a free square. He's not, OJ Howard is not getting as many routes or snaps as like, I mean, look, I, I don't usually bring this up here, but like, let's bring this up here. Week six tight end report. Let's sort by routes per drop back. Since you can't get targeted if you're not running a route. Hell, we could sort by targets if you want. Sort largest to smallest. It's much harder for Jared Cook to get seven targets when he's only running a route 57% of the time that Herbert drops back as it is for Ricky Seals-Jones to get a target when he's running a route on 94.9% .9 of Washington's dropbacks. He played 100% of the snaps last week. He's 3,700. OJ Howard? Where's OJ Howard? He got like six targets last week, didn't he? There. He got more than Ricky Seals-Jones. He ran routes on 42.9% of Tom Brady dropbacks. He is a blocking tight end who got like, there's a very big path to failure here. He got targeted on like 39% of his routes. Okay, well, that means I should play Cameron Braid. Cameron Braid only got targeted on 15.4% of the routes he ran, and he only played 57.5% of the snaps and only ran a route on 62% of those. When these tight ends for Tampa Bay are in there, they're blocking a lot. I want tight ends that are only in there to catch passes. So, like, Ricky Seals-Jones at 3K was still not a free square because it's a tight end. And he caught like a 50-yard touchdown, right? Where does that report come from? It's made for me every single week. It's my own personal spreadsheet. Waller against Philly at about 10% seems awfully good. Yes. Great week for Waller. Uh, at a low percentage because he's underwhelmed, right? People have not been real excited about the season that Darren Waller has had, but we know what his ceiling is. We saw it in week one. 19 targets, 10 catches, and a touchdown, 29 points. And since then, he's just kind of been like, okay, because it's tight end, right? Right? Can Philly gives Miles Sanders the ball this week? I don't know. I'm not in the room. I know he's playing enough. 
He's playing enough snaps. He's over 80% of snaps, which is really not that many running backs in the league play over 80% of the snaps for their team the last few weeks. I think two weeks ago, he was at like 76%. He was one of four running backs on that slate in week five that played over 75% of the snaps, so only four. And then last week, he played like over 80%, but there were more running backs on that slate that played over 75%. But still, one of the few that is getting the vast majority of snaps at the position for their team. There are other tight ends for cash, but RSJ is really good value. Yes. There's more tight ends than usual this week. Gibson, look, OJ, uh, OJ Howard's fine. I just don't think that, like, I don't think that he's a must play, right? I don't think he's a, the way that the question was phrased was, is he a free square? No, I do not agree that he's a free square. I think he's fine. I especially think he's fine in Tom Brady stacks. Like if you're playing Tom Brady stacks, I definitely think that he should be in your group and be in your group over Cam Brait. Now watch Cam Brait catch two touchdowns. Like he would be my preferred tight end, would be OJ Howard. And so therefore, <laughs> don't redact Miles Sanders until they play the Raiders. Okay. So he's on the redacted chopping block this week, Miles Sanders. If Miles Sanders does not perform at 5,100 and 80% of the snaps against the Raiders, he's redacted. I might have to print the shirts. Get a silver redacted, right? Get a nice silver redacted with a green shirt. Or should it be a green redacted with a gray shirt? One or the other. He's on the chopping block. We've already had one guy survive the chopping block this, this year. Good for CEH. CEH was on it. CEH said, you know what? I don't want to be redacted. Then he got hurt. Not his fault. Green on gray would be better. Yeah, I think more people would buy the gray shirt. Devonta going to run into Casey Hayward. I'll have shares. But you like Rigor. I'll say the last thing that I say, uh, I do have to repeat this pretty much all the time because we do have the, aren't you worried about, you know, fill in this defensive back. Projections already have matchups baked into them. Don't double count them. So if you see a wide receiver and you're saying, wow, He's going to have this guy matched up against him. The smart people, the quants, who are doing these projections for a lot of the sites, the mathematicians who are out there doing the spreadsheets and doing the projections for every site and regressing players and doing everything that they have to do based on the math, based on the efficiency of the team that they are playing for and the efficiency defensively of the team that they are playing against, specifically down to the micro of this wide receiver could be matched up 80% of the time on this defensive back uh, and that defensive back typically subtracts efficiency from whoever he is defending. It's already baked in. So their projection on whatever site it is that you use, whether you use Daily Roto, whether you use Fantasy Labs, whether you use Roto Grinders, whether you use Establish the Run, the matchup is already baked in. And if you're going to then reapply it a second time, you're doing projections wrong. Count once. That's going to do it for now. Thank you guys very much for watching the video. Jump in that listener league. Make sure that you get in there, drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and look out for another video right over my face. He's a legend.